Okay, good morning, everybody. <laughs> now that I wrote some number on the blackboard, we'll come back to them in two minutes. Hopefully, some of you know what I'm talking about. Some of you just uh, a <coughs> set of numbers. So, um, what I did uh, was already two days ago on Wednesday. I <coughs> kind of very generally said what high energy physics is, and hopefully you remember it was L equal question mark. OK, so that's where we are. And we tried to get uh, what it is. And I <coughs> told you that we actually have kind of a way to do it. And the way that we do it is that we impose symmetries. We put input, whatever fields we like to do, that's an input. And then there's a machine. You know, it's like an algorithm. And the algorithm is you write the most general Lagrangian, and you truncate at some point, And we usually truncate at the uh, the fourth order of the field. So if you think about expansion, like you know, <coughs> classical mechanics we expand in x, here we expand in phi. It's basically the same. Okay? And then I went through kind of a somewhat long story about flavor physics. And the bottom line was that flavor physics is far from generic. Okay? And I make the point that is both in a standard model, so the way we did the standard model, we let flavor to be violated in a very specific way. And moreover, in this standard model, the one that we see in nature, the parameters are such that they are actually things are far from generic. Okay? And <coughs> what I showed you last time was that uh, I showed you that the <coughs> CKM matrix, which is the only matrix that violates flavor, is very close to the unit matrix. It's a generic. It doesn't have to be. I forgot, neglected to mention it also. The quark masses are far from generic. Okay, so let me write you the quark masses now. Mu is about five mega electron volt. Md is about nine mega electron volt. Ms is about eighty. M charm is about one point five giga electron volt. MB is about 4.3 giga electron volt, and M top is about 174 giga electron volt. And if you look into those numbers, you see that they are far from generic numbers. So if I say to you, hey, pick up six numbers with 1 and 246 giga electron volt, most of them will have a GeV in there, right? So if I tell you, pick a number between 1 and 200, most of the numbers would be bigger than 1 if you randomly choose. And we see that this is far from a kind of a random choice. Okay? <coughs> By the way, we don't really understand it. Let me just say one thing. It's a very general thing in, in physics, is that when you see something like this, and I think it, for, for some of us it's already so intuitive, you immediately take the log of those numbers. We're so used to taking log. And when you take the log, then you say, well, that doesn't uh, that start looking kind of normal. Right? So if actually for some reason you say that actually I'm not asking you to pick number, I'm asking you to pick the exponent of some number, then actually that looks something normal. And that's kind of a hint how you try to explain those numbers. So how okay. does one determine the mass of a very low <coughs> So that's very complicated. What we even define as the mass of those quarks. I really didn't <laughs> want to, to get into it, but since you ask, it's a very interesting question. Okay? And the answer is as following. At low energy, we know that the quarks are confined. Quarks cannot go to infinity. So when I ask you what is the mass of the electron, say, oh, that's very easy. Well, we are theorists, OK? It's very easy. I take an hydrogen atom. I take the electron away to infinity, which means like one centimeter, OK? And then I measure the mass of this electron, and it's totally fine. And then you ask me, hey, but what about this interaction that the electron have with the proton? I said, come on, I mean, it's one centimeter. You know what? The interaction is zero. Say, yeah, yeah, you're right, it's zero, OK? And then we understand what the mass of the electron. So let's do the same here. I take the, a, a pion, a pion made of, say, a U and a D quark. I take the U and start pushing it away. The more I push it away, the interaction becomes bigger and bigger. So what does it even mean to define a mass of something that I cannot separate? That I, it cannot be isolated, OK? So <laughs> in a way, it's totally ill-defined parameters, and actually, the way I like to think about it, and I kind of hinted about it all the way on Wednesday, that we don't want to define parameters. 
All we need to define is that I made one experiment, and based on the rest of one experiment, I can move to the other experiment. So then we can define what is the mass, and this is a absolutely just a definition, and it's really not the definition that we are usually used for a mass. And the way we define the mass, we say, oh, we also know one more thing about QCD. One more thing that we know about QCD, that actually at very, very high energy, QCD behave like a weakly interacting uh, theory, just like uh, electromagnetism, OK? So actually, when I take, say, an electron, and I bond a proton with extremely high energy electron, the electron kind of see three quarks that hardly interact between themselves. OK? So then I say I can define the mass of the U, how the mass of the U is behave when I actually bombard the proton with extremely high energy electron. OK? And the way we define these masses is when the electron has a, an energy of 2 GeV. And the mass of the proton, if you remember, is, a, is about 1 GeV. It's, uh, it's like a <coughs> 931 point something uh, mega electron volt. OK? So that's how we define them. We define them given if we are actually bombarded it with 2 GeV. If I would define it with bombarded it with 5 GeV, then this number would be more like 3 mega electron volts. OK? So I, 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 I went through kind of a long detour only to ex <laughs> all I wanted to say is those numbers are very, very non-uniform. Uh, uni OK? Good. <coughs> OK. So what I like to do today, I like to talk about the effective field theory. But before I put this uh, little thing on the, on the blackboard, and <coughs> these things I copy from a book, which now most of us look on the internet, that's called the PDG. Let me just ask, how many of you never heard about the PDG? Don't be shy. Tell me the truth. Only? Ah, OK, OK, OK. Most of you, no. <laughs> Half of you never heard about the PDG, so let me tell you what the PDG is, OK? So the PDG stands for Particle Data Group. And it's basically a book where you take all the experimental data that physics, particle physics did in the last whatever, I think forever, actually, since, since T goes from Big Bang till now, OK? And <laughs> you collect all those data, and you put it in one book, OK? And <laughs> For those of you who have ever seen a phone book, how many of you saw the old-fashioned phone books? I still remember. You still? Yes, it's still? <laughs> OK. Because these days, nobody. But I remember, you know, when you were a kid, hey, can you call a session one second and you go around the phone book? So for the untrained eye, the PDG looked like an old-fashioned phone book, OK? You open the PDG, and there's a huge list of decays. They say, hey, what the B meson decay to? And you open the book, and you start seeing. The probability of the B decay to decay to final state 1 is this. And the list go on and on. They kind of call it gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma 3, and it keeps going, gamma 100, gamma 200, etc. And by now, we say, OK, you know, we measure roughly 300 different decay modes of the B meson. And you go to the PDG. And for each decay mode, it's given something like this. It says, what is the, the branching ratio? BR stands for branching ratio, which is basically what is the probability. If a B decay, what is the probability that decay for this specific uh, final state? OK? So you say, well, I open the PDG, and you start looking. And as I said, for the untrained eye, it's just total amount of data that tell you nothing. However, and that's the point of us being a particle physicist, is that actually we take this data and we said, wow, look how nice of a structure we can get out of this uh, Phone, phone book, OK? You know, in, in real, real phone book, it's kind probably also can get kind of, a, kind of a structure. You say, wow, amazing. All the numbers in Tallahassee start in whatever is your area code? 850. You say, wow, there must be some underlying structure here, <laughs> OK? <coughs> so uh, <coughs> I copied a few entries, OK? And it's an exercise that I really like to do. I just kind of. After we teach some particle physics, say, hey, take the PDG, look at those entries. Can you really explain to me why those numbers are from the theory point of view? So that's what I like to do something really, really fast here, kind of recall what we did last time as a warm up exercise. I know it's very early in the morning. It's like, so <coughs> I wrote you the decay mode, like B plus decay into a D0 bar, muon, and neutrino. And here I, I wrote the quark level transition, which is kind of the that is easier to calculate, OK? 
So <laughs> based on what we talked last time about the structure of the standard model, let's look at the difference between those two. Okay, what is the difference between those two? Basically the difference that in the top one we have a B decay into a C, okay? And here we have B decay into a U. And what would do we see in the branching ratio difference, okay? What we see is that one of them is 10 to the minus two, and the other one is 10 to the minus five, or you know, that's almost one, so maybe 10 to the minus four, okay? So which one is bigger? Obviously, this one is much bigger than this one, okay? Much bigger, is it like a factor of 200, 300 more, yes? So a probability, we just say it's the data, okay? The data, we say that the probability when I have a big quark, the probability of the big quark to decay into a C is about 300 times more likely to decay into a U quark, okay? And a priori, you say, you know, it's a flavor of physics, why it's preferred to go to one flavor rather than the other, okay? And <coughs> what the answer is, for those of you who still remember something I talked on Wednesday, Anybody? Any brave person? Yes? The CK matrix element, very nice. And if you remember that I <coughs> was plotting, so <coughs> the CK matrix element go like this. <coughs> and so when we have the decay of the B to C, is this element, which is of order 0.04. And when we have the B to U is this element that was of order 10 to the minus 4, okay? There's few other factors that uh, make it not, it's not just, a, you know, naively it's just this number squared because this is what happened. So the vertex that we have for the decay is B going to C or U, and here we have VCB or VUB, depend on the thing. And then we have here the muon and the electron. So it's roughly this, uh, <coughs> and squared, and that's the reason. So the point is, that it's not just I'm just coming and telling you nice stories, I hope it's are nice, but I also actually base them on data, okay? You really look at the data, okay? And basically, I always say that as a theorist, that's what I call doing an experiment. Say, hey, go do an experiment, that means open the PDG and see what you get, okay? So you go, you do the experiment, and you see that indeed, this is what's going on. Okay, let's look at the other set of uh, decays. This one is K decay into a pion, and it's a probability of about 5% to happen. And another one, K to pi plus nini bar, a <coughs> very interesting decay. I definitely own this decay a lot of publicity. I <coughs> worked on this decay a lot. And what we see that this decay is order 10 to the minus 10. Okay, so the difference between those two is more than eight order of magnitude, it's almost nine order of magnitude. And what is the difference in the decay? This one is S, go, S going to U, and this one is S going to D, okay? Huge difference, do you see? Okay, so again, someone, can you remind me, can you <coughs> remember what we're talking Wednesday? What is the reason, what is the theoretical reason that explained those numbers? What was the, the thing that I was talking about that explained those numbers? Yes, yes? Very nice, thank you very much, okay. So this one is flavor changing neutral current because it's S going to D, they have the same charge. This one is flavor changing charge current because it's S and U. The S and U have different charges, okay. And as we made a big deal on Wednesday, flavor changing neutral current are extremely suppressed. They are not there at three level, they're only there at one loop. And moreover, in this standard model, there's extra suppression factor like CKM and, and GIM that I didn't get into details, but they are more suppressed, okay? And then you look at the data and you said, wow, it's really what we see, okay? It's not just that, you know, we make a kind of interesting model, we really see it in the data, okay? And if you go through the PDG, you can actually look for many, many more of those decays. And <clears throat> the amazing thing is this huge phone book, we basically understand all of this based on those kind of basic, I, ingredient that I was talking to you on, um, <coughs> on Wednesday, okay? Are we good on this? Uh, yeah. I have a very naive question. So yes. You call this a matrix, but this is not usually the way you make predictions, because the row and the column entries are different. Yes. 
<laughs> so, I mean, one important thing, this is a unitary matrix, it's not a emission matrix. And when we have the emission matrix, that's where our intuition that they are the same. When we have a unitary matrix, it's really a basis change. And when you think about it, it's <laughs> something very intuitive. Just in normal quantum mechanics, when you have two basis that no, do not commute, okay, you can always put some unitary matrix that move you between one basis to another. Okay, usually those, you know, when we do quantum mechanics, usually they are like, would be some very, very large ma matrices. In this case, it's three by three matrices, okay? But if you think about even the simpler case of a spin half um, <coughs> fermion, and you think what is the matrix that I diagonalize sigma z or sigma x, I can move between them by some uh, unitary matrix. Maybe I should ask a question differently. So is there a process that turns u into c? So this, a U going into C is a flavor change in neutral kind, therefore you cannot have it. So right. a tree level, a tree level, this matrix only allowed transition that change charge. So okay. the tree level, this is always a coupling to the W. Okay. So this okay. matrix is, we can write it also something like UI DJ, where UI stands for UCT, this stands for uh, <coughs> DSB, okay, times VIJ, okay, and a W version. So this is the matrix that couple only to data. In order to go from here to here, you need to insert it twice, and then it will come a one loop uh, process, and it's, uh, it's highly suppressed. Okay? Good. And thank you for asking questions, always more fun. So <coughs> I decided to do one last point about this uh, uh, <coughs> general story about the smallness of FCNC, or the smallness of flavor change in neutral current, a kind of to even more solidify the point that the, the standard model is extremely fragile. It was built such that it's really explained the data and almost a small, a very small deviation from our model building result in something that cannot explain nature, okay? And the question is why we don't have flavor change in neutral current at three levels, okay? So <coughs> we have several bosons in the standard model and <clears throat> they are the photon, the gluon, that's uh, the strong interaction, the Higgs boson, the Z boson that come in the weak interaction, and the W plus minus bosons that are charged. And what we, I didn't go through the derivation, but what I told you that at the end of the day, this one coupled in an off diagonal term, that is, it's actually mixed all the up and the down, okay? but all the other couple in a, <clears throat> diagonal way and moreover in a universal way that is coupled the same. So if I have a photon, the photon coupled, say for a U U bar, it's coupled proportional to the charge of the photon, of the, of the U, that's the usual thing. A photon coupled according to the electric charge and how it's coupled to the charge of the, of the charm. Or the charm, it's coupled like this with the, with the charge of the charm and the charge of the charm is the same as the charge of the U, it's happened to be Two third. So we find that the photon coupled, it's only coupled UU bar, but we don't have, so I don't have something like photon U bar C. This one is not there. You just write. I told you, you just tell me the input, what I want. I write the most general Lagrangian, and this one is just not there. Okay? You just cannot write this term. Okay? And the same for the Higgs. Okay? I write the Higgs. The Higgs coupled to UU bar and it's coupled to CC bar, but we don't have, so that's one. No, I don't have this one. I don't have HCU bar, and the same for the Z and for the gluon, okay? And the fact that we don't have it at three level and we only have it at one loop results in the fact that this is very, very small as we see in the data, that it is very, very small. So what I like to explain now is why fundamentally we don't have those kind of things and what are the ingredients that actually make this, uh, <coughs> that uh, we don't have it. And how can we actually change it and could we actually done something different, okay? So let me start. So the first is about those two, about the photon and the gluon. And what is the reason why we cannot have a coupling like this, that the photon coupled to a U and a C bar? And the answer is, this is based on a symmetry argument, okay? Basically, by the fact that the photon and the gluon are gauge bosons, and they are massless, that's automatically guarantee that they're coupled only in a diagonal way, 
Okay? So basically, the fact that the photon and the gluon do not have such coupling is very robust. Yes? I just say I, I want my theory to respect electromagnetism, then automatically I know that the photon cannot uh, do it. Okay? That's a robust prediction. And one thing that <coughs> I always do when you have kind of a more crazy model that you write down, and if I write it down and at the end of the day I find such coupling, I know that I made a mistake. Okay? This cannot be. So these two are very robust. Basically, any model that you write, you kind of guarantee that those two will not have flavor change in neutral current. That's nice. I mean, we see we don't really want it. And I want to emphasize, we don't want it because the data tell us it's very, very small. I want to now talk about the two others. And for the two others, actually, it's far from robust. It's very delicate, and we had to kind of make sure that we are there. So let's first talk about the Higgs and why the Higgs have no flavor change in neutral current. And the answer is <coughs> as follows. Let me first give you the technical answer and then try to explain what really stands beyond it. The technical answer is that both the, flavor, the coupling of the Higgs boson and the masses of the quarks come from the same term in the Lagrangian. So what we have in the Lagrangian is the Yukawa coupling, Yij phi, <coughs> something like, say, uh, Ui bar Uj. That's the term in the Lagrangian that I have. And this term gives us two things. Why? Because the Higgs acquires the VEV. Okay? So you it's it on the size of the Mexican hat. You see, I'm saying it. No, no. <laughs> you see it on the side of the Mexican hat. It acquires the VEV. So then from here, what we get? We get Yij times <coughs> V plus H times U bar I Uj. And what is this V plus uh, H? V is a number, that's the VEV, is the <coughs> value of the Higgs when it sits away from the minimum. And H is a field, is the Higgs field. So what do we see here? What we see here is as following. The V U by U is the thing that gives us mass, okay? So from here, I get the mass, the mass matrix, Mij, is equal to Yij times V, okay? And the Higgs, which is a coupling, then from here I have a coupling term, Okay? And the coupling term <coughs> is I usually call Yij, which is the coupling in front of the H U by U, is equal to Yij. Okay? It's a kind of a, a, <coughs> a little bit abused notation. This is a capital Y and this is a small y. Okay? So the point is what we see at the end of the day, that the coupling between the physical Higgs and the, and the mass both are proportional to the same matrix, to Yij, okay? So once I diagonalize this matrix, why I want to diagonalize this matrix? Because in general, when I see a matrix, I want to diagonalize it. But moreover, because I want to work in the mass basis. So the mass basis is when this matrix is diagonal. That's called the mass ba basis, right? So in the mass basis, when this is diagonal, then automatically also this one is diagonal. You see it? Yes? Good. Now, <coughs> why this is so fragile, okay? Basically, the, the condition that we have here is that all the interactions of the Higgs is the same interaction that give fermion their masses. And that's a far from a trivial uh, uh, statement. Because I can have many ways to give masses to fermions, okay? For example, I can have Two Higgs doublet, not one Higgs doublet. And what happens if I have two Higgs doublet? Okay? What would happen is that the mass would be proportional to the sum of the two matrices, yes? But the interaction would be just proportional to one matrix for each of the Higgses, yes? And in general, when I diagonal a sum of two matrices, I don't diagonal each of them. So if I have two Higgses, let me just take the example. If I have phi 1 and phi 2, then the mass Mij will be proportional to Y1 Ij plus Y2 Ij, okay? And the coupling, say, of uh, H1 to UU bar will be proportional to Yij1, yes? And when I diagonalize this, in general, I, I do not diagonalize this. Do you see? Yes? Okay. And actually, uh, there's also other ways to give quark masses. And the bottom line is as following. That in a generic model, if I actually had a lot of sources of 
fermion masses, the Higgs coupling will not be diagonal. And in the standard model, it's this very fact that we made very minimal choice of the Higgs sector, that there's only one Higgs, guarantee that we don't have flavor change unitary current in order to explain the data, okay? So <coughs> when we say that we built the standard model and we put just one Higgs, and they say, like, why you put just one Higgs? You could put two. And the usual answer is, you know, it's minimality. I think it's called Ocon Razor, right? Like, if you don't need something, just don't do it, okay? If you can do it with one, why do it with two, okay? Which is a good answer, but actually we find that there's actually much deeper reason why we are doing it. The deeper reason is actually if I just put two Higgses, then in general, the model will not explain nature because it's giving me flavor change in neutral current at tree level that will be too big to explain the data, okay? So we see that actually the standard model says it's fragile. We cannot actually, we need only one Higgs, very, very minimal Higgs sector from flavor physics. The flavor physics tell us something about it, okay? <coughs> Good. Um, <coughs> let me move to the last one, which is the Z boson. <coughs> And here I'll be a, even a little more brief. And for the Z boson, why the Z boson couple diagonally? And the answer is as following. So the way we are getting our quarks to, uh, <coughs> to have masses and electric charge and all this and the coupling to the Z come after the spontaneous symmetry breaking in the model. And in particular, I didn't go through it and hopefully you've seen it before, Q is T3 plus Y. What, what is T3 and Y? Q is the electric charge of the quark, and the electric charge of the quark is come from where it sits in the doublet plus the hypercharge that I gave it. So let's take an example. For example, I told you that the Q left doublet was <coughs> a U left and a D left, and it's kind of easy to remember. U is up and D is down. That's why we write it like this. Actually, it's kind of interesting. That's, we call it up and down because of isospin. It just happened also to be up and down here. But this is this, okay? And it's having hypercharge of one over six. So let's calculate the, the electric charge of each of them. So what is the electric charge of this? What is T3? So T3 is the eigenvalue when I apply sigma three on it. So this plus half and a minus half, okay? So this one have the electric charge is half plus a six, and this one is minus a half plus a six. Okay, which is equal to two-third and minus a third. Yes, so that's how we get that the up quark have charge of two-third and the down have minus a third through this formula. Okay, and actually it's not only working for the up, it also work uh, up and the down, it also work for the charm, the top. All the quarks in the standard model have the same thing. However, <coughs> So what we learned that in the standard model, all the particles that have the same Q also have the same T3 and the same Y. Do you see it? They are copies of each other. However, in general, that doesn't have to be the case. I can actually make Q, the same Q made of different T3 and Y. I can give you an example. Let's take the two-third of the up, okay? Let me give you another example how I can get two-third. I can get two-third. <laughs> equals zero plus two third. Wow, that's amazing, wow. <laughs> right? What do I mean by here? I mean that I can actually have a U-type U, a, a U -type kind of quark with an electric charge of two third that was actually a singlet under SU2, okay? And have a hypercharge of two third, yes? And this thing that have a charge of two third, for us in the infrared, it looks just like a normal U quark. It has something that has an electric charge of two-thirds, okay? And this thing would mix up with the, this U charge, this, this quark, okay? So what I'm going to tell you without going through the algebra is the following statement, okay? The reason that the Z couple diagonally to, to quarks is because all the quarks in the standard model that have the same electric charge, say two-thirds, also have the same hypercharge and the same T3. Okay, so in the standard model, it's a very peculiar decision of us when we did the model building to say that all the quarks with the same electric charge also have the same Y and the same T3, okay? If this was not the case, then we would have flavor change in neutral current 
from the z. Good? So the point I like to make is that unlike the photon and the gluon, where the fact that they do not have flavor change units are kind is, is very robust, it's based on a symmetry argument, the uh, Higgs and the z absent of flavor change units are kind is very specific to the way we build the standard model, okay? The people who build the standard model were <coughs> smart enough to say, I want to do this little trick to make sure they don't have flavor change in current. So that's why we choose only one Higgs, and we choose that all the quarks that have the same electric charge also have the same uh, T3 and Y. Okay? Good? Yes. So that, uh in your lecture from the first lecture, will you say that this is an accidental or emergent <laughs> symmetry? No, so that's actually an imposed uh, symmetry because I impose it, okay? All I'm saying is that this is kind of, uh, you have to be very careful to keep it. So when we actually try to go beyond the standard model, okay, and when you try to go beyond the standard model, one of the things that people try immediately is to have one extra Higgs boson, then it's not so trivial. You have to be very careful and you have to start doing tricks, okay? So all I, what I want to say from this example is that I really want to, to deliver this point about flavor physics, okay? That flavor physics, what we see in nature, I mean, the fact that we see this kind of pattern in the PDG, okay, and I gave you just a taste of it, okay? You're welcome to use all your weekend to read the PDG, okay? And <coughs> is the fact that it's far, far, far from generic, both by the way we are, we constructed it, and very little difference in the way we construct the standard model is ruled out from flavor physics, okay? So both the generic structure of how we put it in, that guarantee that we have flavor changing only through W and also the, the numerical value of the parameter. So are you with me? So I really hope you know one of the things that I kind of you take home message, I hope I delivered that the flavor structure in the standard model is far, far from generic. I didn't go through the other parts of the standard model. They are much more generic than the flavor structure. Yes? So from a symmetry breaking perspective, like this is, this is like an easy way to talk about group theory, I guess. An easy way to talk about like the symmetry breaking pattern in yes. the standard model, right? Yes. So like can you, can you, I don't know, it's hard for me to, to, to <laughs> yeah. see, like, why? I guess, I guess, like, what you're saying, th th this choice is the same thing as choosing a particular symmetry breaking pattern. For the standard model. <coughs> so, yes, you're totally right. So, the way we did the, the standard model, again, we, we follow our algorithm. And once we did the algorithm, you know, once we choose the, when I choose my field, everything follow, and then, you know, that's kind of out of my control. All I'm saying is that, Making it a little bit different in the choice, you're going to have a disaster, okay? You know, let's say you are making a cake, okay? So <coughs> usually, uh, let, let me say, a cake and a soup, okay? In a soup, usually, it's not make a big difference, you know, by mistake, okay? I, you have to, to put, you know, like one spoon of, of salt, you put two spoon of salt, nobody will have noticed, okay? However, when you do a cake and you have to put one spoon of uh, baker powder and you put two, it's a disaster. Okay, so that's what I try to make the point here. That some parts of the standard model, like the soup, it's not make a big difference. Some is more like the cake. You have to be very careful on what ingredients you put in. Okay. Good. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so let me move to the second part, and what I'll try to move now to discuss is effective field theory and the standard model effective field theory, okay? So, I know you already heard quite a lot of effective field theory, but one good thing about uh, learning is some repetition, it <coughs> kind of makes sure that things are, yeah, so I'm gonna repeat some of the things that you already heard, and hopefully I will do it fast enough. So let me kind of uh, go back to the almost very beginning, and that's the more very, very generic story of what is a field theory, okay? I'm, I don't have the E, yes, okay? Just what is a field theory. And <coughs> the way I like to think about field theory is field theory is a continuum approximation of a discrete system, okay? 
And maybe this is a little surprising that that's the way I like to describe things because you say, no, I mean, field theory is continuum. It's a continuum. And I say, no, no, no. The way I like to think about field theory is really it's a continuum approximation for something that is discrete. And with some example, you're totally going to agree with me, OK? Let's talk about several fields. For example, let's talk about uh, sound. Sound is a field, yes? How I define the field? The field is something, let me define a generic field. What is a field? A field is something that is a function of x and y. That's a field, yes? And sound waves are fields, right? We have waves, OK? We call them voice, yes? We know the frequency. You know, ah, uh, that, you know, so you see the, the different. We all know that these are fields, right? Yes? But we also totally know that they are discrete systems. What is really where they are going? They're going in our, in the air, OK? So what's happening is that we have some air molecules, and we have some waves in those air molecules. And those waves are the continuum approximation of what's going on in the discrete system. Are you with me on that? All of us agree with this? <coughs> very, very good. And why we can do this? Why we can actually make the continuum approximation? Just because I care about things that are much, much bigger than the size of them, OK? So when, I, when we talk, OK, and we talk at, say, whatever, 400 hertz, OK, and the speed of light is whatever, 300 meter per second, then the wavelength of my voice is something like a meter, roughly, yes? And what is the distance between the two molecules that carry it? is whatever, <coughs> have an angstrom or something like this, okay? Much, much, much smaller than the wavelength, okay? That's why we can approximate the motion by this. Clearly, if you try to make a sound wave with a frequency of 10 to the 20 hertz, okay, you cannot use the continuous approximation. It makes sense to everybody? Yes? Okay. <coughs> Let's talk about the water waves. OK, same story. It's the molecules that go there. OK, let's talk about something that we don't talk too much about uh, in field theory. Let's talk about uh, density of people. OK, you can think about density of people as, uh, as a field theory. OK, maybe, you know, I don't know, it's probably actually <laughs> very important. But you see that it's a field theory. You can actually, and if you look at scales that are like the old uh, Earth, then of course you can talk about density of people, yes? But if I want to ask what is the density of people on, uh, on this chart, the answer is <laughs> it's a very stupid question to ask. Why? Because when I talk about density of people, it's only valid when I talk about uh, large distances. I can talk about density of galaxies, density of cluster of galaxies. Yes? And I can think about it as waves, as long as the distance is much bigger than whatever, 10 kiloparsec or whatever it is, or a megaparsec. So it's just a matter of scales. OK? So you are with me on this? Good. So <coughs> what I want to say is that each, each field theory have what we call a cutoff. What is a cutoff? A cutoff is a place where beyond this place, the theory is not valid anymore. Yes? So for example, in sound wave, we said, I cannot describe my theory for wavelengths that are smaller than about whatever, angstrom or whatever, a, a micron or whatever it is, yes? OK, for density of galaxies, it's valid only for distances bigger than 10 kiloparsec or whatever. So every theory have a cutoff, and we actually distinguish two cutoffs. We have the infrared cutoff, the infrared, and the UV. These are just words, OK? Infrared means short distance, and UV means long distance, OK? They came from optic, but uh, hmm? This is short distance, and this is long distance. Did I say the other way around? This is short, short distance, yes. and this is long. And I said the other way around? So I would say, <laughs> thank you. You know, I, I'm just, it's early in the morning, so you always put some mistakes, so you see that you are awake, right? <laughs> it's a very well-known trick. <laughs> OK, so what is the infrared cutoff? Infrared cutoff is, say, I can talk about things that are bigger. OK? For example, I cannot talk about things that are bigger than the size of the universe. Doesn't make sense to talk about sound waves of distance that is much bigger than the size of the atmosphere, right? Or wavelengths in the ocean that are bigger than the size of the Earth. OK? That's the infrared cutoff. What is the UV cutoff? The UV cutoff, 
is for short distances that we just talked about. Okay? So presumably every field theory have, have such a cutoff. Okay? So it's kind of we, we all those examples I gave you, it's kind of obvious. Okay? However, maybe there's some field theory that these cutoffs are not that obvious. Anybody can have an idea where it's not that obvious? Of a field theory? Someone that, uh, you know, that is not that obvious what is the UV cutoff of some other field theory. Much more one that we all know. I don't know if love is the right word to describe electromagnetism, but we all know it quite well, right? So Maxwell equations, when you write the Maxwell equation, you define the electromagnetic field. What is the UV cutoff for Maxwell equation? Are Maxwell equation valid for any value of electric field? Or at some point you say, you know what? I don't trust my Maxwell equation anymore. So can I just, so, you know, electromagnetic field is a field theory. Usually it's the only one that we really study in physics, right? And we really ask the following question, is Maxwell equation valid to any short distance? Where you stop believing them? It's super, super close to the electron. Yes, uh, how you define super, super close? Is it a kiloparsec? Is it a micron? What, what would be the very, so you're totally right. What I try to do is what is the physics that tells you stop, you know, you're too close to the electron. <laughs> Don't come, well, and you cannot. So, it, so what is really the thing, classical field theory? When is the distance, when I come too close to the electron, that I say I cannot trust anymore my, max, my classical Maxwell equation? The electron one, mass, one over the electron mass. Because what happens when we come too close to the electron, closer than the distance one of the electron mass, then we start taking into account electron-proton, uh, electron-positron production. And electron-proton produ production are not there in classical field theory, okay? So we know that electromagnetics also have some fundamental UV cutoff, and this UV cutoff is not as simple as a sound wave, where we know it's made out of, but it's actually fundamentally quantum mechanically, and it's a quantum mechanic a process of electron-positron production that tells us I cannot actually use classical electromagnetism uh, <coughs> anymore, okay? And even if you say, you know what, I don't mind, I know quantum field theory, so you talk about classical quantum mechanics, why I cannot come closer to one over the mass of the electron. When I do quantum field theory, I can take into account electron-proton, electron-positron production. And the point that eventually, we will come to something called the Planck mass, or the Planck scale. In the Planck scale, we start have quantum gravity, and quantum gravity is supposed to take into account fluctuation of space-time, and then we know that we cannot really use a <coughs> field theory. So the point is, any quantum field theory have a cutoff. Sometimes it's an easy cutoff and simple to understand. Sometimes it's a little more complicated. But there's no fundamental continuum. There's always some discrete nature that we have to do. Every theory have a cutoff. OK? And <coughs> this is really important. And the important thing about the fact that every theory have a cutoff tells us something fundamentally extremely important. Okay? That our field theory cannot be the theory of everything. Is that clear? Because we have a cutoff, it cannot be the theory of everything. Because the theory of everything should take care of everything by definition. And if it has a cutoff, then I just told you cutoff means that you cannot apply it somewhere. That means that the field theory cannot be the theory of everything. Yes? Wow. Amazing. What shall we do? Well, we put an extra letter, and then we are also <laughs> fine. OK? So now we are saying, OK, you know, I mean, there's so many issues in there also. I cannot explain what's happened at distances before below 10 to the minus 35 centimeter. OK. But I do effective field theory. That is, I only care about things that I can calculate. Very nice. You know, we are very modest as physicists. We only can do things on 40 order of magnitudes, we cannot do on infinities. OK. So this is the idea of effective field theory. Effective field theory, the way I like to define them, is that every theory have a cutoff, and therefore we only work with effective theories, that is, that are not valid everywhere, and they cannot be the theory of everything, but we don't really try to do the theory of everything. OK? 
Let me do a little more uh, <coughs> philosophical on this point. In physics, in general, we never care about exact result. Never. We only care about approximation. We proud approximator. Okay? You know, sometimes I don't know if you have like some math friends. They said, <laughs> you just approximate. Did everybody ever tell you this? <laughs> you just approximate. I said, no, no, it's the other way. Right. We really approximate. We know how to approximate. That's what we are doing. Okay? You just do exact result. Who cares? <laughs> okay? Why I don't care about exact result? Because physics is an experimental science. We have to compare to experiment. An experiment always have an error. Therefore, I don't care about being precise. All I care is that the theory error is much below the experimental error. So I don't never care about exact result. Okay? And therefore, in principle, I never care about the theory of everything. I just don't care. Of course I care because I love math and I love exact result. I mean, it's so beautiful, right? I mean, I'm not saying that it's not. I, we all love, we love math, right? I mean, it's amazing. But as a physicist, I don't care, okay? So <coughs> that's why effective field theory is really the way I like to think about it. And if you think about it, we always did effective theories, okay? From the very beginning, when talking about other things, we talked about effective field theory, okay? <coughs> Good. So we kind of define effective field theories. And let's talk about um, what is effective field theory now. Effective field theories also go under the name of scale separation. Okay? I really want to discuss things when I change the scales that I describe different scales. In the example of the sound waves, I care about scales of order, the, you know, the, the wavelengths of my, my waves. And whatever it is for normal waves that I care about, then the scale. I don't care about scale much, much smaller than the wavelengths and not scale that are much uh, <coughs> bigger than <coughs> all things. So what I do, I always find some small parameter, and I expand in these small parameters. Always. We do it so many times in physics. So many times in physics. Okay? We, so many times we don't know what to do if we don't have a small parameter. Okay? Right? I mean, uh, <coughs> isn't Archimedes said this? Give me a point outside Earth and I can move the Earth. Who, who said it? You know this statement? Ar Archimedes. He said it, right? Archimedes, yes. And I paraphrase on Archimedes. Give me the small parameters and I know how to expand. If I don't have the small parameter, I don't know how to expand. I don't know what to do. So we need to find the small parameters in our theory and then we know what to, to, to expand. So what we always do, is this, find the small parameter and expand in the small parameter. And <coughs> I'll give you a very well-known example, is the pendulum, okay? And we already did the pendulum, the, the potential was one over cosine theta. They say, well, if it's, a, give me a small parameter. What is the small parameter of the pendulum? Is the amplitude. So if the amplitude, which is a fundamental dimensionless number is very small, so when a theta, is much, much smaller than one, that's dimensionless, so I can do it. When I do this, what I do? I take the cosine and I expand the cosine. Yes, and then I solve the problem. And if you want to take higher order effect into a <laughs> higher order effect into account, you uh, expand more and more terms. Good? Now in effective field theory, what we, do, what, we, what we do? In effective field theory, we have to find the small parameter. And the small parameter in effective field theory is usually defined as E over lambda. Let me tell you what are those symbols, okay? So E is the typical energy that I care about. It's similar to the amplitude that we have in the pendulum, okay? So I cannot say that the pendulum is always harmonic. When I can treat the pendulum as harmonic, only when A is very small. When A is very large, it's not a pendulum and it's not an harmonic oscillator, yes? So it's really depend on your initial condition. It's really depend on the specific setup that we care about. Okay? In effective field theory, it's the same story. We have some fundamental scale of the theory, and we have the typical energy that I care about. And if in the specific experiment that I'm doing, the typical energies are much smaller than the cutoff scale, I can do it. Okay? So this lambda will be the cutoff scale of my theory. Okay? Let's call it cutoff scale. Lambda cutoff, and this is the energy of the experiment that I'm doing. That's the small parameter. If this parameter is not small, I cannot do effective field theory. 
If this number is small, I can do effective field theory. Is it clear? Yes? OK, so that's the way we are doing effective field theory. Basically, we expand in, uh, <coughs> in this small parameter. And what is this uh, cutoff scale? The cutoff scale is basically like 1 over the distance. OK, so you know, energy goes like 1 over r. So if I have a, a sound wave, this lambda cutoff would be 1 over the distance between the electron. You know, with some parameters that you know could be the speed of sound or whatever. That there could be some other parameter, but it's roughly speaking, it's one over the distance scale to do the cutoff. Okay. So when we think about the field theory that have a cutoff in space, this cutoff in space can be translated into a cutoff in energy, and smaller distance corresponds to higher energy cutoff. Okay. So they are the same. Yes. So that's uh, <coughs> that's what do I do? Okay. <coughs> Very good. So let me give you one last example. And this example is something like this, OK? So how do we describe this? OK, which chapter in Landau Lipschitz is this? OK. <laughs> I really think it's 29, but I, shit, I don't really remember my Landau Lipschitz by heart. Rigid body, yes? So this is a rigid body motion, OK? What is the effective field theory of rigid body? What do I need to take into account? What are the two energy scales? OK, so one energy scale is the energy that I give to the pen. That will be E experiment, yes? What is lambda cutoff? Lambda cutoff is the energy that keeps this as a rigid body. It's not fundamental rigid body, OK? Probably I cannot do it with the pen, OK? But if I'm strong enough and I give it enough energy, the pen will break, OK? And that will be away from the effective field theory description, yes? So when we do this, we expand in powers of energy over the cutoff. Good? <coughs> Very nice. OK, so that was kind of an effective field theory before we go into the standard model and party physics and all that. <coughs> Are there any question on this and the way I like to think about effective field theory? Yes? It's a little more philosophical, but so did the people who pioneered think that they had gotten the theory of everything? That's right, yes. Did they think it was effective even then? It was, it's, it's a huge deal. And actually, um, <clears throat> kind of a very interesting historical thing. And actually, yesterday at dinner, we just, me and Svi were sitting together, and we had a long discussion about exactly this point. OK? And when uh, QED was discovered, and more, more important, when the standard model was discovered, um, the standard model was put forward in the 1960s. And people didn't take into it very seriously because they find that it's, they didn't realize that it's renormalizable. And then they say it's not renormalizable, therefore it cannot be the, the full theory of nature. And people were dismissing it. Okay? People like Landau, in general, Landau said all field theory are crap because there's something called the Landau pole, which basically what Landau said, it's all crap because there's a cutoff. And then, you know, I cannot really argue with Landau. I mean, but I mean, if I could, I would say, you know, Maybe you can do effective field theory. And they say, well, you're right. I actually did it all my life, OK? But people, it was a, a big thing about the fact that we, people really tried to get it all. And the big jump of the standard model, where people were actually took into start believing, yes, this is the right theory of nature, was when actually Veltman and Tooft were ever actually to prove that it is renormalizable, OK? And then people say, wow, it could be the full theory of nature, and therefore it's took, it's took off, OK? Fast forward 40 years later, then all of us come and said, who cares about renormalizability? I mean, I can only care about effective field theory. Write the standard model, who cares, OK, and we move on. OK, the, the truth is somewhere in the middle. Of course, it's very nice that it's renormalizable, because then you can really, really trust your calculation much more than when it's actually non-renormalizable. Okay? But the history is that the importance of renormalizability really changed through the years. Okay. And I, I really remember 30 years ago when I attended some summer school, and the lecture was like make it was like an, one hour long about like how important renormalizability is and why we really don't want to write dimension five terms. And now I come here and I'm just telling you, you know, I kind of exaggerate the point a little bit, but okay, you know, it's okay. We don't know how to calculate everything. All I care about is that I can calculate what I care about. Okay. 
So yes, you're totally right, and the history is kind of very interesting. And what V was telling me yesterday, he said that he feels that you know sometimes people do the right thing from the wrong reason. And the standard model is so nice, and they did it because it was renormalizable. And if by chance it was not renormalizable, people will not take it so seriously. But at the end, now we say, OK, it's not such a big deal. OK, good. <coughs> Any more? Yes? I, I agree with what you're saying, but uh, at the same time, when you take this part and part, Sorry? When you take this part and part, yes. you're still missing the, you're still missing somehow to get some intuition of the disease. I totally agree with you. So, so yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I push too much, Laura. I put too much. I agree, I agree. I should have not like pushed that much. Okay, I agree. I mean, I don't want to say that renormalizability is not important. It's actually really, really nice, and the fact that we have a theory that is mathematically consistent to all orders really, really make the theory much more predictable, much more trustable. Okay. However, the point is that effective field theory have a very important part of what we are doing. Okay, so. We friend now? <laughs> okay. <coughs> Good. <coughs> so <coughs> let me take the first example of effective field theory in, uh, <coughs> in particle physics, and that's the four Fermi theory. The four Fermi theory. And this, the four Fermi theory, it's also have an historical, very important uh, <coughs> story. So the point is that, uh, let me kind of tell you the history. If the people found beta decay much before they understood the, even before they understood quantum mechanics, they understood that there's a beta decay. People really didn't understand what's going on. And the first person who made a prediction for beta decay was Fermi. And Fermi said, all I need to do is put some four Fermi interaction into the theory. So what is beta decay? In beta decay, what we see, we see a neutron decay into a proton electron <coughs> and a neutrino, OK? And now we know that that is actually kind of D going to U electron neutrino. But back then, it was a neutron decaying to a proton, electron, and a neutrino. And what Fermi said, something that right now sounds like almost the most trivial thing to do, said, how can I explain such a decay? Let's put a term in the Lagrangian that involved those four fields, OK? So I have a term in the Lagrangian that he, now we call it G Fermi. OK? Time n, p, e, nu. That's some factor square root of 2 that we don't care about. And I don't know if Fermi called it G Fermi or people after him <laughs> call him G He did. And as I said, the G come from gravity, because it was G Newton. And then obviously, that's what can we, we do, OK? Because fields create an annihilate particle. So this one annihilate the proton, annihilate the neutron, create a proton, create an electron, create an neutrino, and you have this thing, OK? Extremely trivial. I mean, I think now with, with, with the way we are teaching physics, that will be an obvious thing to do. Say, hey, how can you explain beta decay? I said, Let, let's write this kind of, a, <coughs> of an operator. OK? And the point is that this operator is not renormalizable. So people said, you know, that's really, really nice. But there must be a more fundamental theory that explains those kind of things. OK? And then, of course, we found the standard model. And in the final standard model, we know how, this, how beta decay goes. It goes through W exchange, OK? So in the Fermi theory, I describe this in the following, OK? D, U, E, nu, with a coupling G Fermi. And in the full theory, we know there's a W exchange. And in the full theory, what we have, we have a D, U, W, <coughs> and electron, and a neutrino. That's the full theory, OK? So how? These two are related. What is the relation between those, uh, <coughs> those two theories? OK? And what we understand now is the relation is as follows. OK? <coughs> Let me first do it very technically, and then we do it a little more intuitive. So let's write this diagram. OK? So we know we have here. Here we have a G, here we have a G, some CKM. I don't really care about, but this, the amplitude for this diagram, roughly speaking, go like G squared, because I have here a G and here a G, OK? Over the propagator. And the propagator is MW squared minus 
Q squared. Okay? And then I say, what is this Q squared? Q squared is the energy flow through here, and the energy flow from going through here is something of order the mass of the neutron, okay? Because the neutron decay. So it's something of order the mass of the neutron, roughly. Well, it depends on the kinematic, etc. but it cannot be bigger than the mass of the neutron, okay? So this one is roughly, very roughly speaking, okay? We love this sign, we love this sign, okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's roughly speaking g squared over mw squared minus m neutron squared. And numerically what it is, the mass of the w is very close to 80 GV. The mass of the neutron is very close to 1 GV. Okay? So 80 is roughly 100. So this is 100 squared minus 1 squared, which is also known as 100 squared. Okay? <coughs> yes? So this is roughly g squared over mw squared. Yes? Because this is a very small number. Very technical what I did so far. So what I found, I find something like this. I find that my amplitude, that in principle is depend on the kinematics, it's depend on Q, it's have some kinematic things, okay? When I do this approximation, I find it's just a pure number. Yes, you see, this is a pure number. So what I neglected is not only that I neglected a number of order 10 to the minus 4, I neglected the only number that is actually depend on the kinematics. So I fundamentally made a big difference here. I take an amplitude that depends on the kinematics into an amplitude that is a constant. Yes? What we are seeing is that approximately, this amplitude that is approximately, de that is depend on the kinematic, approximately doesn't depend on the kinematic. And when it doesn't depend on the kinematic, I can write it as just a point that is proportional to a number. OK? Do you see it? Yes? As I said, that was very technical. I really, I mean, <laughs> as technical as I can get in those lectures, okay, with this sign. But if you do it correctly, you know, and you go and do find them, you really see what, that that's the, the, what we are doing. And what we are doing here in terms of a little bit more of, a, um, of the physics, what we are doing is as following. We say the W, the mass of the W is much, much bigger than the relevant energy scale of the theory, okay? The theory is neutron decay. And the fundamental thing that's going on is something that happened at distance scale of 1 over mw, where my distance scale that I care about is the mass of the neutron. It's just like sound wave, OK? The wavelength that I care about is 100 times more than the fundamental scale that separates the atoms, yes? So the mw corresponds to the distance between the atoms in the air, and the mass of the neutron corresponds to the wavelength of my voice, OK? And therefore, I can treat it actually as an effective field theory, and I can forget about the dynamics, and I can write it as a number. OK? So that's called the effective four Fermi theory. OK? And <coughs> what we, we did here is, uh, <coughs> is, is basically the leading order expansion in this. It's the zeros order. And if you like to actually expand it, this theory is very easy to expand. Why? Because I know the full theory. It's exactly like the pendulum. In the pendulum, I know my full theory. It's 1 minus cosine theta. And I know how to expand cosine theta. That's really easy. OK? This one, it's a little more complicated to expand. This one, it's four dimension. It's Minikovsky space, et cetera. But it's the same idea. We can expand this propagator. We can keep higher order term. And we can actually do correction to this thing. OK? So in principle, we can do expansion in E over lambda, and we have the effective field theory. OK? So we understand how we do effective field theory on, uh, <coughs> on those kind of things. <coughs> OK, very nice. So let me tell you a little uh, cool story about effective field theory and <coughs> Glashow. So Glashow was the person who invented the SU2 cross U1. OK, of the standard model. And he got the Nobel Prize for this, together with uh, Abdus Salam and Weinberg. And the story is, the history is that in 1961, uh, Glasher wrote, the, wrote the, the, uh, <coughs> the SU2 cross U1 model. And in the paper, he said, I have no idea how the W gets a mass, because in SU2 cross U1, the W doesn't get a mass. But I don't know what to do with it, so I don't deal with it. And I keep moving, and I say, look how nice it is. And yes, I have a big problem, but I don't care about it, OK? 
And then, you know, Peter Higgs came in 1964 with the Higgs mechanism, and Abdul Salam and uh, Weinberg in 1967, I think as far as I know, independently come with the idea that that's how the W get the mass. Okay? So in a way, what they did, they just say they took the model of Glashow and fixed this one problem that Glashow had. Okay? And one people say, you know, it's a huge problem. I mean, you can't write a model where you have a mass, where the model predicts that it's massless and it's massive. And you say, well, yeah, that's, I have a problem. And Glashow, in a way, didn't care. Okay? And that was the greatness of Glashow. I mean, most people would never dare to put such a proposal out because they say, obviously, something is wrong. I predict a massive W for something that I don't know how to explain. But Glashow said this thing, you know, let's put it aside. I don't care. Someday I will come back to it, or someone else will come back to it. I still write the model, and he was correct. Okay? And this is approach. This is an effective field theory approach. I said, you know, I don't fully understand what's going on. It's a short distance phenomenon I don't fully understand, but I still kind of see what's going on. Okay? And that's something that I found in physics many times a right thing to do. And that's like, yes, I know there's some issues, but I'm not going to solve all my issues at once, and it's okay as long as I'm making some progress and I delay this for other things. OK? <coughs> Good. Any question on the four Fermi effective theory? Who? He proposed the Amnius theory. Yes, it was the same story? Massless. was already. But I thought that Young Mills was like totally theoretical back yeah, then. He was hated by power. Oh, yes? Because of, uh, <laughs> yeah, because of the, the mass by hand. So. I see. <laughs> But you know, don't take it too seriously. You cannot just say everything, I don't care. I mean, there still should be a lot of new stuff, and it's just some small point that you still cannot do. That's totally fine. And if you can solve it all, then it's better, actually. OK. <coughs> so <coughs> I want to talk about one more thing before I move to discuss the standard model effective field theory, and that's the difference between scale and Effective scale, we love this word effective, right? Everything is effective, effectively. So what is really this scale uh, lambda? So I was telling you lambda is kind of the distance between the particles. And when I did this, what was the scale lambda? I said the scale lambda is one of the mass of the W. Yes? However, this was not precise enough, because what is really the scale, the scale is g squared over mw. So the scale is basically, or if you in energy scale, is mw squared over g squared, because they, they're also coupling that enter into my story, OK? So I want to separate two things, scale and effective scale. The scale is defined to be where the, what is the masses of the heavy particles. So that will be mw. That's the cutoff scale. The effective scale will be mw over g, OK? Because that's really what's enter into my expansion. OK? And this scale, the effective scale, it's higher than the scale for small coupling. So if g is a small number, then the effective scale is bigger than nw. OK? Now, in the standard model, g is 0.65. So this is not a big deal. It's about 50% enhancement for the scale. OK? So instead of being 80, it's something like 120 or whatever it is. OK? However, if g is a very, very small number, then there's a very difference between the scale and the effective scale. OK? But the expansion doesn't care about G. So the expansion cares yeah. about MW over G. But not there. So the, the small parameter, the small parameter is this, right? Oh, so in this case, the expansion doesn't care. The expansion is, G, is Q over MW. Yeah. OK? In some cases, you do care. So yeah. there's different. So what I wanted to say is that these two things are Sometimes we care about this, and sometimes we care about this. And it's not always the same. So many times when you say, oh, when I do an effective field theory, what I'm expanding is the inverse mass of the heavy degrees of freedom. Sometimes the expansion is actually in the heavy degrees of freedom over the coupling. OK? So and this appears to be a much higher number than this. So if I have an effective field theory where the heavy masses may not be very heavy, but they have a very small coupling, then I can have actually a better behave expansion than when I have just, when I only consider those, uh, those numbers. OK? Now, usually when we put bounds on scales, 
Many times we put bounds on the effective scale. Okay, so I'm not going to get into the details when I for for the rest of uh, when I want to do the standard model effective field theory. But I just want you to realize that there's actually the effective scale that enters into the expansion may not be a pure mass. It can also involve some uh, some coupling. Okay. Good, so now I can finally go to the last point I want to make. It's going to take the rest of the 20 minutes. <coughs> Smith, it's already have a name. It's famous enough. Smith, can you say Smith? So the standard model effective field theory, it's basically a <coughs> the effective field theory of the standard model. So we. Usually when we say standard model, we implicitly mean standard model up to dimension four. And the standard model effective field theory is taking the standard model and writing higher order term. And I want to emphasize that this is not the most general extension of the standard model, okay? Because I can extend the standard model by adding light degrees of freedom. The standard model effective theory is actually an extension of the renormalizable standard model using the assumption that there's no extra light degrees of freedom. And everything is heavy, and I can actually do effective field theory and expand in a higher order dimension. Okay? So that's the idea. The idea is that we expand in some power of E over lambda. And E would be our energy scale that we probe, say, at the, at the LHC, et cetera. So it's maybe up to the mass of the W, maybe 1 TeV or something like this. And lambda is unknown. It's still unknown. Okay? Now, <coughs> Why do we like to extend the standard model? Well, first, because we can. And second, because there's actually a few things that the standard model do not uh, explain. For example, neutrino mass, dark matter, biogenesis. You know, I can go on and on and actually disguise those. But to this, for this lecture, I just say there are actually quite a few very interesting phenomena that we cannot explain, and we try to extend the standard model. OK? OK, this, <coughs> just this. OK? Now, when I do this uh, standard model effective field theory, do I know what I extend on? Okay, so we know that the extension is in the E over lambda. So I know what this E is. It depends on what I do the experiment. But what is this lambda? What is really the scale where the particle is coming in? And here I don't know, which is very different than this. In a way, it's very similar to the, story, the situation where Fermi was in the 30s. So Fermi said, I don't know what I expand in. All I know is that I can do the expansion. And 40 years later, people found that actually the mass of the W, that's the lambda that enters into the, into the Fermi theory. When we do the standard model effective theory, we want to go beyond the standard model. And this is something yet unknown. So this lambda corresponds to masses of yes unknown particles. We don't know what they are. And when we don't know what they are, what we can do, we try to get some uh, educated guess of what they are. Or we can put bounds on what they are, depend on different operators and different stories. So that's what I want to do now. Okay? What I like to do now is actually discuss this kind of uh, what, what is this lambda. <coughs> so to start with, I want to put a scale on the blackboard. And the bottom of the scale is MW which is of order 10 to the 2. Everything is in GeV, OK? And in the top, I put M Planck, which is of order 10 to the 19. So what I know about this lambda at this point, it is somewhere between those two numbers, OK? Because below 10 to the 2, I have the standard model. And above M Planck, I know that my field theory breaks down. So fundamental field theory breaks down there, so I know it must be below this. I mean, it could be this or below. So I already made a huge progress. It's only 17 order of magnitude, OK? Compared to infinity, <laughs> it's huge, right? So now let's see what we actually start. What can we put, start putting thing into this, uh, into this story, OK? <coughs> Good. So let's uh, start doing it. So how we do it? We write the standard model. And the first thing that we write is dimension 5, because we start doing expansion, and we write dimension 5. So I write L d equal 5, and L d equal 5 goes something like this. Yes, that's the dimension 5 operator. This is dimension 5, and therefore it's suppressed by 1 over lambda. And this lambda now is some effective scale. 
because I could have here, I could have had also coupling here, dimensionless coupling. So that's the effective scale. It doesn't have to be the masses of some intermediate coupling. It's some combination of masses and, um, and coupling, OK? So what this term is doing for us? So this term is doing uh, quite a lot. And uh, let me say that this is far from trivial that there's only one term. So you write the dimension 5, and that's the only term that I can write. It's not that I choose one specific term. That's the only term I can write. And after the Higgs acquires a VEV, then what these terms give, give us, it results in two things, OK? It results in mass for the neutrino. And the mass of the neutrino that I get from this term is roughly mw squared over lambda, OK? Very roughly. I love this symbol, as you, we already know. And the other thing that it does for us is break lepton number. And those of you who were in the colloquium yesterday, that's the whole point of the colloquium yesterday was that we really try to find experimentally if this is correct or not. But from the theory point of view, I write my dimension 5, and I find those two things. It gives us small neutrino masses and lepton number violation. So then you can go out and say, hey, what do I know about it? OK? So you say, so far, lepton number cannot be violated. And by the way, let me back up a little bit. Remember we talked about accidental and approximate symmetries of the standard model? And I told you that accidental symmetry are there just because we truncate. Once we go up, they may not be there. So that's an, a nice example. When I truncate at, L equal, at D equal 4, I get lepton numbers and accidental symmetry. I add dimension 5, it's, not, it's broken. OK, really nice. Like <coughs> so we go and see, we, we look for lepton number violation. We didn't find it so far. And from that, we can put bounds on lambda. But the more impressive one is going for neutrino mass. And actually, we found that the neutrino have mass. Okay? And we know that the mass of the neutrino is roughly 10 to the minus 1 electron volt. Okay? So since we actually found that this is non-zero, we can actually get lambda out of this equation. So from here, what I get? I get that lambda from this, lambda is roughly mw squared over the mass of the neutrino. Yes? So let's do it together. MW is 10 to the 2. MW squared is 10 to the 4. This one I told you it's about 0.1 electron volt, which is 10 to the minus 10 giga electron volt. So this number is roughly 10 to the 14 giga electron volt. OK? So what we found, just by the fact that neutrinos are massive, we found that there is some scale here, which I call it m ni, which is of order 10 to the 14. Now you say, well, is it exactly 10 to the 14? Well, I don't know. We don't know exactly the neutrino mass. This is the effective scale. It involves some coupling. It's not really the masses of those, et cetera, et cetera. But roughly, based on this very naive way of doing the standard model effective field theory, that's where we are. OK? Are you with me on that? And this scale is actually kind of close to another scale. And the other scale is what we call the GUT scale. And the GUT scale is roughly 10 to the 16. And what is the GUT scale? The GUT scale is a theoretical story that tells us that if you actually look at the way the three coupling constant of the standard model runs, they roughly meet at about 10 to the 16. And it could be that at 10 to the 16, we have a, what we call grand unified theory, where it's combined the three uh, coupling of the standard model, OK? And you may have heard of uh, SU5 grand unified theory and SO10 grand unified theory. But the point is that those theories have a scale in them. And the scale that we actually know, 10 to the 16 GV, is an experimental scale for grand unified theory. So grand unified theory is a theoretical idea, but the scale is based on data. So this 10 to the 16 is based on data. And this 10 to the 14 is also based on data, OK? And actually, in grand unified theory, if this is correct, that will be the full theory that explains the effective standard model. Just like here, we have the weak interaction explaining the Fermi theory. So here, it will be the grand unified theory that explains the standard model effective field theory. And actually, you go to grand unified theory, you do the calculation, and you find that actually it predicts neutrino mass. And I can actually relate the neutrino mass to the parameters of the fundamental theory. Okay? And when you do the calculation, you find that there's actually some 
factors of over the hundred or so floating around, and that actually can very, very well be the case, okay? So we don't know, but, you know, grand unified theory are very attractive possibility, and that's one of the indications that this is attractive, because these two numbers are basically working out, okay? <coughs> Good. Any question on dimension five? So what should we do next? Dimension six, very nice. Thank you very much. Where do I do dimension six? Let's do that here, dimension six. Okay. So unlike dimension five, in dimension five, actually, I could write only one operator. In dimension six, I can write many, and it depends how you count, but, um, you know, it's always count in a factor of 100. Is there 699 the number that people are quoting? Anybody remember how many dimension six the operators there are? So <coughs> it's a large number. And people actually write very interesting, like even how you count and how you define how many, but it's hundreds of operators. It's much, much, it's, once you go to dimension six, it's much richer than all the five first dimensions. It's a huge amount of, uh, of things. So we kind of separate them into classes of dimension six operators. Okay, so dimension six operator. And let me talk about different types of dimension six operators and say what bound we can take for the different type of dimension six operator. So the first type of dimension six operators are those that break baryon numbers. Okay, for example, I can write an operator like this, LQUD. I can write this operator and you can check for yourself that this operator is uh, conserved uh, that you can allow, that is symmetric and you can write this operator and it's suppressed by lambda squared, okay? And this operator break a uh, baryon number because Q, U, and D, each of them have a baryon number of a third, so this operator has a total baryon number of plus one, so it's break baryon number, okay? And what this operator can give us, this operator can result in proton decay. Let me write the amplitude that this operator is <coughs> giving me. So it gives something like this. Here I have a D and a U that become a, po a positron and a U bar. And here I have another U. Okay? So this is a proton. Yes, U, U, D is a proton. And U, U bar is, say, a pi zero and a positron. So this result in P plus going to E plus and a pi zero which is totally okay in terms of electric charge and the uh, um, <coughs> spin and all this, okay? The only reason that this one is forbidden in the standard model is because we have baryon number. But baryon number is an accidental symmetry. When you write higher dimension operators, it should not be there. And indeed, I write dimension six, and I see it's not there. I can write an operator, and I can do it, and I can calculate, okay? So I can actually take it, and I do a calculation, and I said, this result in proton decay, and the proton lifetime will be proportional to this parameter lambda, obviously, yes? And it's proportional to actually the lifetime, it's proportional to the amplitude squared, the amplitude scale like one over lambda squared, so the lifetime of the proton should depend, will go like one over lambda to the four, yes? Good, so what you do, you take a lot of protons, and the way we are doing it practically, you just take a lot of water, and you wait, okay? So you put the water in, in 1970, and every few years you have to change the water in the pool, okay? And you still wait, and now at uh, 50 years later, you look it up, and you don't see proton decay. And you say, you know, what should I do in the meantime? In the meantime, you do neutrino oscillation experiment, you get some Nobel Prizes, but you still wait to see the proton to decay, okay? So that's super Kamiokanda and those kind of an experiment. Basically, that's what they are doing. They put 50 kiloton of water waiting for the protons in the water to decay. You wait 50 years and you didn't see yet the proton to decay. So what you do, you put a, a bound on the lifetime of the proton and the lifetime of the, of the lifetime of the proton depend on the specific mode. And this mode is the one that is one of the easiest to look and therefore the bound is, is best. And the bound for this lifetime, the lifetime of the proton is about 10 to the 34 years. And just to compare it, this is a very large number. The lifetime of the universe is about 10 to the 10 years. Okay, so that's about 24 order of magnitude bigger than the lifetime of the universe, okay? So it is a really long number, okay? So practically all the protons are stable, good for us, right? So 
<coughs> we know that we have a number. So what we can do is this. Now we can actually take this experimental number and translate it into a bound of this lambda. OK? And what you find, you find that the bound tells us that lambda has to be larger than about 10 to the 16 GeV. OK? So here I already put 10 to the 16 is already taken. OK? So I cannot, well, maybe I can. I write this gut, and it's also lambda from proton decay. From proton decay. Proton decay. So we found something kind of interesting. OK? We found that just the bound on proton decay tell us that the effective coupling from proton decay is larger than the effective coupling that I need in order to explain neutrino masses. OK? So it's not like it's kind of in the same area, but it's not exactly the same. But everything points into this direction. The bound from proton decay, grand unified theory, neutrino masses, all of them go roughly to this area in thing. OK? So what is going on? As of now, we don't know. That's why we are, you know, there's fun going on here. We still need to find out what's going on, OK? What could be the case is that there's actually a reason why the proton doesn't decay. For example, we can impose baryon number. Baryon number may be an imposed symmetry rather than an accidental symmetry. And then I cannot write this operator at dimension 6. And there I don't have a problem by the fact that this is bigger than this. Another possibility is that actually some small coupling involving. So actually, the particles that go there are actually lighter, but this effective scale is higher. But we don't know. It's kind of interesting, and there's a lot going on in <coughs> into this. OK? <coughs> Good. Um, <coughs> We're almost done. As you can tell, there's some room here, so I want to fill up this room, and then we'll be done. So now, let's assume that we actually, there's some reason why the proton doesn't decay, and I cannot write this operator. Say, in my full theory, I impose baryon number, and therefore I'm not caring about it. Then I can still ask the question, what is the bound of lambda? So I write more operators. As I said, there's hundreds of operators. And the next type of operators that I write are operators that violate flavor. And in particular, I can write operator that give me flavor change in neutral current, OK? And that can bring us back to the uh, flavor structure that I was talking about. I can write an operator like this, <coughs> SS d bar d bar over lambda squared. And this operator can give me KK bar mixing. I already talked about KK bar mixing. This operator can actually take a k on into a k bar. Okay, so I get a kion going to <coughs> a k bar. A kion is s bar d, and here I have s d bar. Okay, so this is the operator. It's giving me kk bar mixing. And I already told you that in the standard model, kk bar mixing is extremely small. You remember, I wrote it here. You remember at the very end of Wednesday, I wrote this long formula that said five factors. And I told you, you know, each of them is another small parameter. So it's extremely small in the standard model. And the standard model explains nature. Because it's so small in the standard model, that means that this operator must be also very small. Otherwise, it will violate what we see in experiments, OK? That means that actually this operator gives me quite of a good bound on lambda. So you put all these numbers in. And the fact that the standard model agree with the experiment, within the errors of the standard model, so the new operator cannot be much, cannot can be bigger than the error that we have. Then what we found, we found <coughs> that it's actually somewhere here. So the bound from KK bar mixing, or very generic from flavor, is of order 10 to the 8. OK, so the bound is much weaker than the bound from proton decay, but it's still much, much bigger than my scale of the weak interaction. OK, so we basically have some six order of magnitude going on here. OK. So what we learn, and actually I only talk about k on decay, but you can also look on b decays and other things going on, and the numbers are roughly the same, okay? 10 to the 7, 10 to the 6. So you look for many, many processes. I, three more minutes, okay? And these are where we get from flavor, okay? So the answer is that flavor physics give us quite strong bound, not like a baryon number. However, and here come a big however, 
bio number, I have a, in my arsenal of model building tools, I can forbid those terms. How I forbid those terms? By imposing bio number. Is there a way for me for forbid this term? The answer is no, because I know this term is there already in the standard model. Okay? Therefore, I cannot forbid this term. So in that sense, this is actually the strongest unavoidable bound on the standard model effective theory. So flavor physics give me the strongest unavoidable bound on the scale of the new physics, of the scale of the extension of the standard model. So whenever I extend the standard model, the standard model extension must have some reason that this operator is highly suppressed. Okay? And then you'd use all those model building tools to make it very small, either by making the masses heavy or making the coupling very small or some, some things. Okay? So the point to make is that when you go beyond the standard model, you need to take into account flavor in order to satisfy this bound. This is a very important bound when you do model building. That's very important. <coughs> now, let me just say the very last uh, bound that I wanted to mention is that assuming that we actually have forget about flavor bounds and do things that are not flavor, that are what we call flavor blind, they come from so-called electroweak precision uh, uh, calculation like from the ratio between the mass of the W and the mass of the Z. I'm not going to get into a lot of details, but let me say that the non-flavor bounds are here, electroweak precision, non-flavor bounds, and they are roughly a 10 to the 3. Okay? They are roughly 4 or 5 order of magnitude below the flavor bounds. Okay? And they are also something that you cannot avoid by a symmetry, just like the flavor <coughs> bounds. Okay? <coughs> so... <coughs> If you look into this uh, kind of scale, what we conclude is as following, okay? Going beyond the standard model and write the standard model as an effective field theory, we have a good reason to believe that there's something going on, okay? A lot of really interesting stuff happening around the gut scale, both theoretically, experimentally, mass of the neutrinos. And proton decay, my view of it is it's very encouraging. It's actually, we're almost there. Just wait another five or ten years and hopefully we'll see it, okay? I mean, <laughs> maybe not, but uh, <coughs> I, have, uh, I, I have a hope, okay? So we roughly wait for 40 years, okay? And <coughs> those of you who know the story, I'm Jewish, and the story that we keep telling me since I was born is that when the people of Israel left Egypt, okay, they had to go in the desert for 40 years until they got to the promised land, okay? And... Actually, one a technical term that we use for grand unified theory is called the desert. The distance between here to here is called the desert. So just based on my, you know, from, from childhood, I know that all I need to do is wait 40 years in the desert until I get to the promised land. Okay, so now we are 50 years waiting, but we're almost there, okay? So I have some hope. <coughs> so maybe something really interesting going on here. And for the flavor part, what I want to emphasize is the fact that this is the first term that you cannot impose a symmetry for forbid, okay? And therefore, flavor physics always put a huge amount of input into model building, and we always need to kind of uh, <coughs> take care of what's going on there. Um, <coughs> okay, so that's basically what I uh, had time to tell you, and I'm happy to discuss more. I'm still here for a little bit. Thank you. Tuning neutral currents must have uh, significant differences uh, between the second and the third generation. So suppose you can avoid, presumably you can avoid some of these constraints that you showed for the strange quarks if you look at exactly, the Exactly, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so there's many, many ways to avoid these uh, constraints, okay? One way to do it is, um, there's many ways. One way that I can explain now is the idea that's called minimal flavor violation. And the idea is that actually all the, when you go beyond the standard model, also everything is somehow proportional to the same hierarchy that we see in the standard model. So in the standard model, we see hierarchy in quark masses and in the CKM. Actually, you can think about an underlying mechanism that relates the structure of the quarks into the structure of the CKM. And then you also can think about it that is related to the structure in your uh, higher dimension operator. And when you do this, then this stem is automatically very highly suppressed. Okay? So that's just one example. The point I like to make 
is that no matter what you do, you always need to do some tricks to take care of flavor bound. Okay, so flavor is far from a trivial story. Okay? And I think that's the, the, really the main point I was trying to make in, you know, in my two lectures, is that the flavor structure of the standard model is far, far from generic. Okay? And we don't know, actually understand why. Just at, at this point, just a fact. Any more questions? I want to come back to the, the software discussion yes. uh, earlier. So as you mentioned, the uh, stature of the normalizability changed over the years. I guess it decreased, if not diminished. Yes. But what about another characteristic, which is the unique completeness of the theory? Yes. So the fact that we, we always, so <coughs> the way we are thinking about it now is that every theory must have a UV completion. That is, there must be something that describes it. The point is how important it is for us to discuss the UV completion. And the answer is that we love to know the UV completion. And actually, what I did here, I already say the UV completion of the standard model cannot be just write everything that's possible. So clearly, the theory that UV complete the standard model, that give us the standard model effective theory, cannot be a trivial theory that I just write all the operators that I can. Okay? Because then we have problem because, you know, we'll see proton decay, but the neutrino mass would be. Yeah. So it, and flavor bounds, all of this is, is, is one big mess of what's going on. So what we know is the UV completion of the standard model must be non-trivial, and therefore the naive effective field theory approach to the standard model is wrong. It cannot be really explaining this. There must be a lot of unknown in terms of the coupling in front of this uh, thing. Okay? So I totally agree with you. We really want to know and understand the UV completion. And there's two ways to approach this question, OK? One question is, uh, let's take an effective field theory approach and don't and delay this question. But of course, the other is to find those UV completion. And I think, you know, I definitely had quite a few papers where I tried to talk about those. I mean, not even quite a few. I mean, definitely more than 10 papers. When I asked exactly the question, can I actually do how this specific model give me this specific operator? And I, I really want to, you know, I, I went a little too far. Renormalizability is important. Just don't take it as the ultimate thing. And it's always, it, it's really always the, the, the point. It's always ask for one, the specific question that I ask, what do I need? And in some questions, renormalizability is not important. And in other, it's actually more important. So where is UV complete? Oh, sorry, I should have explained it. UV complete theory is basically like the theory that generates the effective theory. So here, this is the effective theory was the Fermi theory, and the UV completion is the standard model. Because the standard model is the more fundamental theory that when you actually exp expand it, you find it. Okay? Another way to think about it is that I can take the simple harmonic oscillator as the effective theory and the pendulum as the UV theory. So, so the UV complete theory has to be renormalizable? So the same story. There may be more and more. So the point is that it, the point is, again, it, at the end of the day, there must be a theory of nature because we have nature, therefore there must be a theory of nature. And this theory of nature must be mathematically consistent. Okay? So eventually we should get there. How many steps? You know, we can take infinite steps, whatever number you want, right? I would actually after something slightly more specific. So if yes. it's just a QCD, that is a uni UV complete theory by itself. That's right. You don't have to do anything. I mean, exactly. you, you can, you're allowed not to do anything. Exactly, and also QED. But for the standard model, you are not allowed not to do anything. No, no, no. For, for, for the standard model, as long as we put away gravity, we don't need to do anything. Theoretically. Experimentally, we know. We found neutrino masses, so we know that we have to do something. We have to do something. Because we find that the neutrino is massive. So we cannot take the standard model as is and say, we know that the theory of everything. Because we find experimentally that is n there's some data that cannot be explained by the theory, that's neutrino mass. So, so technically, the standard model by itself is could a UV complete theory. Exactly. Yeah. It could be. What about the lambda mm -hmm. the As I said, because we, yeah, we forget about gravity. So it, it's philosophical. Because we know that the gravity, the standard model is a, is, is a complete theory. Okay? And I agree. There's also a lambda pole. QED has a lambda pole at 10 to the 240 GeV. Yeah. is not UV complete because of lambda. Yes. Okay. So, I mean, but also because of the hierarchy problem. So, the hierarchy problem is, is just the fact that uh, it, it's numbers. So, you know, you can always fine tune the parameter and it's totally fine. But, um, yeah, we definitely get a little philosophical but here. But if you believe in the control precision, 
So the hierarchy problem is an essential flaw because you can have a cancellation. So, so you, you try to do the analysis in the of the data in in, in the. Okay, by the way, reversibility is also the essential feature that you need to put in the data to have precision observations. Because try if you try to do analysis with SMEFT, yes. it's a complete mess. It of course, because this is non-renormalized, so you cannot do precision yeah. calculation for this. But I mean, I want to really emphasize the difference between the hierarchy problem and neutrino mass. These are fundamentally two different. I didn't mention the hierarchy problem for a good reason because I had only three hours and I didn't want to open whatever Pandora box, the rabbit hole, whatever. But the point is that the hierarchy problem basically tells us that the, when you do the calculation trying to calculate the mass of the Higgs, you get actually corrections that are really, really large. Okay. However, from this bottom-out approach, I don't care. I just say that's the, the number that I measure. I don't care. The neutrino mass is something that I have a prediction, and I measure and disagree with my prediction. So there's fundamental difference. And it's not about one problem is, be, is more important than the other. All those things tell us that the standard model cannot be the full theory of nature. OK? And there's many reasons why it cannot be. And as I said, I gave you very little and <laughs> so much to talk about. OK, so uh, let's finish the lecture. And let's actually watch this. Yes, yes, yes.